We are in part four of our Connecting with God series, and this whole year is the year of connecting. 2020, the year of connecting. So we broke out one book into two series. We're going to be going through the book of Ephesians throughout the entire year, and the first series we're going to do is Connecting with God. So we're in part four of that, and I entitled today's message, Loved for a Purpose. And I want to talk about God being personal. You know, there's a lot of people that believe that God is distant, that we have an ancient text, and that God is completely far away. I disagree with that. I'm going to give you 10 reasons from my own story why God is personal to me. And once again, this is my story. doesn't mean that this is your story, but I feel like if I share my experience, you might be able to ping on a couple of those and go, yeah, wait a second, God interacts with me like that too. But I hope you also have some different elements where God is personal to you. So I'm just going to share 10 personal reasons why God is personal to me. So number one, he was one of my first safe places. Now for somebody that struggles with panic disorder, safe places are very, very important. But I was raised in a household where my mom told me from my earliest memories that God was watching over me and that he would respond to me if I asked. So in other words, from my earliest memories, I had an attuned, per personal God watching over me. The Heavenly Father was not just some theoretical concept, but a very personal concept to me. So he's always been that safe place for me. Number two, he understands me when no one else does. He understands me when no one else does. I share stuff with God I'm not sharing with anybody. I'll tell you what, not only is it embarrassing sometimes, but you couldn't handle it if I shared it with you. I don't even share the stuff with my spouse that I share with God. There's certain things I need to process out with him, so he is my confidant. Yeah? Number three, he talks to me in a way that I understand. Sometimes he gives me thoughts about what I should do. Sometimes he gives me thoughts about how I should do it. I have never heard the audible voice of God but I feel overloaded by communication from him. We'll talk about that. Amen. Number four, he plays with me in the sandbox of wisdom and revelation. What do I mean by that? I mean that my mind is super weird, y'all. Uh, stuff that goes on up there. Do you realize that I keep running lists on my computer and on my phone of things like I have a whole list of invention ideas that I just come up with as I'm driving down the road? A whole list of business ideas a whole list of comedy routine bits, a whole list. I got a million things going on. Man, I got so many lists out there because the way that I get all fired up, I'm a thinker, right? So the way that I get all fired up is new ideas. Anything that's a new idea, I get super excited about. So as I'm driving down the road, sometimes something will just pop into my head and it's like, you know what would be an awesome idea? This. And I know full well I start to smile because I know that that is just God downloading something. And he's just sharing with me, and he's like, kid, I know you're never going to do anything with this. I know that you do not have the drive or the capability to follow through. However, I'm going to give you an awesome idea. And I get so excited, and in my whole, I mean, if you could read my pulse, it just quickens every time I'm thinking of these new things. That is a way that only he and I talk. It doesn't mean that that's how he's going to talk with you, but that's how he talks with me. And it makes my whole day whenever I have those. Number five, we read the Bible together. And what do I mean by that? I mean that while I'm reading the Bible, all of a sudden stuff pops out at me that other people may not see because it's for me. Or it's some new idea. It's almost like he's illuminating it, right? Like the Bible says that certain things are only spiritually discerned. So it's like while I'm reading the passage, all of a sudden, not only am I tripping off what I just read, but now it starts popping out all these other concepts that are all connecting the dots, and I'm amazed. And I know that didn't come from me. Just as a side note, there, is, there are artists all over the world, and I'm talking about musical artists or tangible painting artists or whatever, and they get what's called inspirational moments. Like if you ever talk to a creative, they usually are like, I can't just do it if you have me sit down in front of a desk. I can't do it. I got to wait for inspiration to hit. Y'all heard this phrase? In my opinion, 
Inspiration is a download from God. The majority of artists in America are not going to recognize it as such, and they're certainly not going to give any glory, and they're going to use it for their own purposes, but make no mistake, they didn't come up with those ideas. That's God communicating down. That's my opinion. Number six, God's personal because he's my hero. I don't know how many of you grew up in the era where we had posters on our walls. Anybody remember posters on our walls, right? I don't know who you had. Some of you probably had Teen Beat Magazine posters on your wall, right? Some of you had some David Cassidy posters, which you should be embarrassed about. What's wrong with you? And if you ever had a monkey's poster, man, what? All right, now, if you had a poster on your wall, whether that was athletic or whether or not that was musical or whoever it was, a TV star, if you ever had a poster on your wall, what's intriguing was that you knew everything about that person. They felt very personal to you, right? They're like, oh, well, hey, I see that you have a Kobe Bryant poster on your wall. You're like, oh, I'll tell you all his stats. I can tell you when he went, he went here and then he came right out of high school and then this and that and, and this, he scored this many points in 1992, and, right? If you had all that, you, you feel like you know them. They've never even met you. That's how I feel about Jesus. I got the poster of Jesus on the wall of my heart. And if you ever ask me about him, I start going off on his stats, right? Came in out of Israel High, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> my, my whole thing is that I know everything about him. Backwards and forwards, I know his word, right? He's my hero. Number seven, he answers my prayers. Now, let's be very clear. He does not answer the majority, <laughs> right? Man, I'm throwing a lot of stuff up there. He does not answer the majority of my prayers, but he answers the ones that are right. He sifts and sorts them with me, and he does what is right and good for me. And when he moves heaven and earth because I asked him, that's personal. Number eight, he brings me presents. He brings me presents. How do I know that? Because if you have ever received anything good in your life that you did not ask for or pray for, that's called a gift. Yeah. You ever get any of those? All right, then all the time. That is what God is doing, is he's giving you little presents and gifts, and good parents know what each child would thrive in and what they like and what they don't like, and so they're tailored to you. That's pretty personal. Number nine, he's always there. When other people leave and other people walk out on me, me and God just sit down and watch them go, and then we talk about them behind their back. <laughs> Number 10. <laughs> He's really loving and patient with me. You guys, I know this is not what you want to hear, but I have habitual sin in my life. I have things that go on in my world, in my internal world, or whatever it might be, that if you knew that about me, you would not respect me anymore. God sees that and loves me anyway, and he has not chosen to embarrass me. He has not chosen to just throw everything out for everyone else to judge me. He is dealing with me on a very personal basis, and he keeps telling me that I'm his child. You guys, when, when I'm sick of me, He's still with me. And so that's very, very personal. Now, once again, it took me a long time to dial in how God interacts with me. And I sure hope it's not the same with you. Why? Because you're different. Every great parent knows, right? You just don't talk to your kids the same way. This one you're going to talk this way. This one you're going to talk about it this way. He's going to communicate with you uniquely and differently. If you listen to my list and you're like, yeah, I don't know, dude, I'm not relating with that. You don't have to. He knows how you work, so he's going to minister to you in a very personal way. But if you feel like God's not communicating with you, I disagree with that. By the time we get done with the message today, you're going to feel like God is not only communicating with you, he is hunting you down, right? And he's constantly sharing messages. I would suggest that he is communicating with you every day in a personal way, but our receivers aren't tuned in to recognizing how much he's really talking to you. This is what we need to grow in as a church. What's your connection like? I don't know. 
But I do know the the fill-in-the-blank is the bottom line. The the fill-in-the-blank on the sheet in front of you is this. God personally connects with his people. God personally connects with his people. Some people say, well, he's an invisible God. He's distant. He's this. I disagree. Yes, he's invisible, but he's very, very personal. All right. Whenever I kind of doubt and question whether or not God is personal, I have a default verse I go to. And I want to encourage you to write this down, right? Write this down. It is Matthew 1030. I want you to kind of have that in your back pocket anytime you doubt that God is personal. Because this is a this is a phrase that Jesus said himself. Now, once again, if you know it was from Jesus, man, that's a lock. This is really how God feels. Yeah? So here's what he said. He said, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Did you know that? Even the hairs on your head are numbered. That means that God cares about personal details about you that you don't even care about. Man, talk about personal. None of you are tracking on it. Now, I understand. As I look out, there's a number of gentlemen that that's not a difficult thing. What I'm telling you is, what I'm telling you is that he knows stuff about you and he's tracking on it and you don't care. But he cares. Man, I was realizing as I was going about through that passage, and I thought every time I shampoo, he has to recalculate. <laughs> I was like, stuff him. What? Where did this come from? Now we're 10 down, right? All right. But he knows. He cares. You see, last week, Pastor Brian Kiley led us through a message talking about how we operate a lot of times out of a sense of rejection, but that's not appropriate for a believer because he read through Ephesians 1, 4. He said, even as he, God, chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In other words, God told us that he personally chose us. But there's even more good news, and that's where we take off today. All right, so would you turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. It's page 976. If you need a Bible, there's one under the seat in front of you. Page 976, get you there a little bit faster. We're reading out of the ESV. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. We're going to finish with the last two words of verse 4 because they actually go with verse 5. It begins like this. In love, he, God, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Well, that's what we're going to be covering today. I'm going to zoom back and we're going to start with the first two words, in love. Love is a great motivator. Love is a great connector between God and man. Everything that God does in, to mankind has a love motivation. The Bible's very clear on that. And what that means is that it's a beautiful anchor. you got to lock that one in, that if at any time you are studying your theology, how you feel about God, how you think about God, if at any time you arrive at a place that says that God is nasty and mean and distant, somehow you unhooked from the anchor. Why? Because that cannot be the answer. Because God created mankind out of wanting to pour love out, so that can't be your answer, whatever we're talking about, right? As a matter of fact, some of you will say, well, hold up, Pastor, this is where you lost me, man. I've read the Old Testament. There is some brutal stuff in there. Hold up, I never said God wasn't brutal. I said God wasn't mean and nasty, and that he wasn't distant. Oh, God's intense. That is very, very clear. But what's important for us to understand is that love is his motivation. He does not decrease. He does not need us. He does not need to pull from us and fill him up. He's already all filled up. And when you have a relationship with somebody that's all filled up, they can make it about you without having to take from you. That's God. So what he's not doing is stealing from us. What he's not doing is decreasing us. What he is doing is pouring into us, into mankind, out of love. He doesn't need to do any of that. But he is. In love, he did what? 
In love, he predestined us. Man, that sounds like a heavy word, right? He predestined us. What does that mean? It means he had a plan ahead of time. That's all it means. He had a plan ahead of time. He knew stuff, and he organized it out before he got started. Don't we all do that? Okay, so if you are an artist, and you're going to draw a teddy bear, you have predestined that bear to be there. Right? Because in your mind, you said, I got a plan. I'm going to draw it like this. Now, it may not look awesome, but there is a teddy bear now on that painting because you put it there. But you only put it there because you predestined that it would be there. It's a predetermined plan ahead of time. All right. So he predestined us. And you go, so what's so heavy about that? Well, 1,600 years ago, a guy named Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you want to say it, He began to write some stuff down. He was super smart. And he wrote down that as he's studying the Bible, he comes across this concept of predestination. And he starts saying things like, God is in charge. There is nothing that God is not in charge of. And so he starts wondering, maybe we're just going along with a script, right? Like God had already preordained and written out all our parts, and we're just kind of playing our parts as we go along. Well, that got everybody thinking. And for the last 1,600 years, we've been debating, how does that work, right? Like, if we're just doing a script, do we have any part in this? Can we, like, write ourselves a different role? How do we get saved? That's what starts freaking us out, right? We're like, wait, if he already predetermined who's in and who's out, because some people are going to heaven and some people aren't, if he already put that fixed in the stars, and we have no way of determining any different, man, am I already condemned? Am I already saved? If that matters, does it matter to evangelize? I mean, if he's going to do what he's going to do, why do I need to go out and share the gospel? This is where a bunch of people come back and they go, Pastor, hold up. Hold up. I think it's pretty clear in the word, right? John 3, 16. Yep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Pastor, it's pretty obvious whosoever means that whoever joins in and says yes to him, he will grant eternal life. So clearly it is free will and it is decisions. Now you see why there's a debate. So as we look through, is it predestination or is it free will? What is the Bridgeway answer? Yes. Yep, of course it is. You're like, I hate when you do that. Like, that is such a cop-out. No, it's just simply true. Why? Because the Bible teaches both of them very clearly. Why? It depends on the perspective that you're looking at. Both are equally true. If you look at it from God's perspective, things are sovereignly ordained. There was never not going to be a church. God created it, and he said, there will be a bride for my son, Jesus Christ, period. There's no way that's not going to happen. If you want to look from God's perspective about how he orders the world and the universe and about how he's in control of history in the future, you're going to look and all you're going to see is predestination. If you look from mankind's perspective, the other direction up, all you're going to see is personal responsibility, decisions, and choices. But here's the point. It doesn't really matter because Paul right here is not addressing the greater grand scheme of how all things are saved. He's writing a personal letter to personal people that are saved, and he's trying to tell you it was a personal process. You go, well, what do you mean? Well, same thing with you. You guys, look back over your life and tell me how much God has hunted you down. Are you kidding me? This is how our, all our stories go. Something like this. Man, I remember I was a little kid, and I, did, I wasn't necessarily raised in a Christian home. But then there was a kid in the neighborhood, and he went to church and everything. So that was the first time I learned about it. That kid was weird, so I didn't hang out with that kid. But I, I realized that there is such a thing as church. Well, then later on, older, I got older, and there was this hot chick, and she just totally went to church. And I was like, well, I can't date her if I don't go to church. So anyway, I ended up going to church because of the girl. And I was like, okay, it's all right. It's not exactly what I thought. 
not. But anyway, I was doing my own thing. But I knew, I heard something about that message. And then I had all these other people like at work, they were like, well, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. And I hated all of them. But anyway, so then I'm going through my life and all of a sudden I was driving and I was lit. And then all of a sudden I like crashed my car and I was like, oh, I'm going to die. It was a big ball of fire. And then I end up in the hospital. I was like, God, I'm yours. God's like, really? Dude, who do you think crashed your car? And that was me. You're a terrible driver. I could have crashed your car anytime. Man, I was the one that opened your eyes to your neighbor. I'm the one that got your attention all that time. Man, I've been sending you love notes 24 hours a day for years. See, God is hounding you. Why do you think you're here today? Why do you think you can hear this message? It's another love note God drops into your bucket. And he just keeps whispering, come closer. You're my child. How awesome is that? That's all he's trying to say right here. In our groups, we're going to talk about this concept of predestination and free will. As a matter of fact, we're going to highlight out the parallel passage that Pastor Brian brought out last week. What was that? That was actually Romans 8, 28 through 30. Romans 8, 28 through 30. We're going to take those two and put them together and just process it in our groups, our missional communities. Because, man, that stuff's complicated. But it's part of who God is. All right, we're going to study it. Let's move forward. What were we predestined for? It says we were predestined for adoption to himself. That's very personal. He brought us into the family of God to get closer to him as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. He pre-planned to bring us into his family. What does adoption mean? In its deepest level, it is a transfer from one reality into another. Practically, it's the inclusion into a family where now you have a new reality. In other words, you used to be this, but now you've been brought in with new resources. You've been brought in with new attention. You've been brought in with all new things. That's what God did. He brought us in. And it says that he adopted us as sons. And this is where a bunch of ladies can get ticked off. Hold up. What did you say? Adopted as sons? What about daughters, man? Everybody likes daughters more than sons. <laughs> Hold on. Ladies, you do not want this. Here's why. you got to read it in context. We're talking about the ancient world. In the ancient world, sons got stuff that daughters didn't. Firstborn sons got stuff that the rest of the sons didn't. In other words, if we're going to go in this context and you want the best, you want the sons and the first sons' inheritance. In other words, Jesus said, when it gets to spiritual stuff, ladies, you get the best of the best because I'm just trying to direct your attention to who got the best. That's all yours. You don't want the daughter's inheritance. You want the son's inheritance in the ancient world, and that's what you have. Amen? We were brought into the family. It was initiated by God. In other words, God deepened the connection with mankind. So Paul begins to say, it's been quite a journey. I'm going to take you on a journey. For the majority of our time, for the rest, I'm going to take you on a journey through the Bible. And I'm going to explain something about God drawing near to mankind and how much we have pushed him away. So let's begin where all great stories begin, and that is in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, something happened that was rather dramatic, is that we had purified humanity's closest connection with their creator. In other words, there was no walls. We start with stunning intimacy. Naked God walking with naked people. You're like, Pastor, why do you got all the way God's naked? God is naked because here's why. The man and woman were naked and they didn't even have any recognition of that. If God comes walking in in a robe, are they not going to be like, why are you wearing clothes? (laughs) Right? Isn't that going to make them kind of, should I be wearing clothes? Right? God's like, well, it was cold today. I don't think that's going to fly. So God is walking in pure intimacy. There's no walls, no separation, and he's walking. It says he walked in the cool of the day, meaning he would just walk in the garden and just discuss stuff, and there was no blockade. But then what happened? Well, we sinned. 
Sin is a fancy word for rebellion. We said no to God, and that causes all kinds of havoc. That causes chaos. Why? Because God is the only giver of good things, so to do something otherwise is to bring in bad things. Now everything starts falling apart, and it immediately throws up a wall between God and man. So what does God immediately do? He kicks them out of the garden, and you're like, dang, that was a really brutal consequence. They went from paradise, and then they got kicked out. No, it's not. Why? You tell me if you know the Bible, what is the penalty of sin? The wages of sin is? Did he kill him? Nope. He kicked him out of the garden. That's called mercy. He kicked him out of the garden. And then it says he put a cherubim with a flaming sword of fire to block the entrance so they couldn't get back in. You're like, well, that's mean. No, it's not. Why? Do you realize in the Garden of Eden there are two trees that were special? We always talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the one that caused the fall of mankind. But do you remember there's another tree in there? What was the other tree? The tree of life. You know what that is? You eat of its fruit and you can keep living. As long as you eat of its fruit, it creates immortality. They are in a state of sin. They would then eat of the tree and live separated from God forever. What do you call separated from God forever? Hell. He just saved them from that. Saved him from hell, kicked him out when he should have killed him. God has mercy all over this. And then immediately launches a plan of redemption. And he's going to get them back close to him better than they were before. Why? That's God's specialty. Watch how he does this. This is insane. Right? All right, here we go. He starts kind of peppering around the edge of mankind. He starts having one-off conversations with people. Once again, we sinned, we created the distance, he now starts coming closer. So he starts having one-off conversations with mankind. For example, people like Noah, right? Nobody else gets the conversation, but Noah, hey dude, I want you to build an ark and blah, 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 blah. Nobody else gets it, so they all think he's insane, right? But God's talking to him. He starts talking to people like who? Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and a guy named Moses. So he's peppering in and saying, I'm not okay with being far away from my creation. So he starts coming closer. Then he starts to take a big step. I'm going to go from individual conversations to community conversations. So he gets them out of Egypt as a people group, has them at the foot of Mount Sinai, and he's about to have a conversation with them collectively for the first time. Do you remember how this went? Watch this. You can write this down because you've got to study this. This is a pivotal passage. It's in Exodus 20, 18 through 21. Exodus 20. 18 through 21, listen to how it went. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far away. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we'll listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. <laughs> Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. But the people stood far away while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. How did it go with the big community meeting? Everyone said, don't you dare talk to us. You scare us. You freak us out. We'll have Moses. We're cool with a mediator, but you do not talk to us directly. God said, I want you to come close. He said, nope, not on those rules. You either do it our way or we don't want to hear from you. Do you understand how much limited communication is because we're not willing to interact with God on his rules? We want him to communicate on our rules. So guess what? We stand far off and only a few are willing to go into the thick darkness and draw near to God. God created the closeness. We created the distance. You following? But God's not content. Because even though that went really, really poorly, he then launches phase B, which is what? Mediators. 
So he starts using angels. If you guys remember the Old Testament, there's a lot of angels doing stuff. Oh, and then Gabriel did this, and then another angel came and told him that. In other words, God said, well, if you're scared of me, that's fine. I'll send one of my buddies. They'll come and give you my messages. And people were kind of cool about that. But God knew they needed more daily connection, so he instituted three offices. Prophet, priest, kings. Prophets, priests, kings. What are prophets? People that are mediators, special individuals that God speaks through so that he can get his message to his people on a daily basis. What are priests? People who help the process of connecting God by offering sacrifice on your behalf. So in other words, you don't offer your sacrifice. You bring your raw stuff to them. They then give it to God and give you back information. Kings. God always wanted to be the direct ruler of his people. They said, we don't want you. We want an earthly king. So he worked through a mediator. What's the problem with mediators? Anybody ever play the game of telephone? Problem is distortion. God says or does stuff, and it comes through a damaged, distorted human individual, and then you always have to doubt it, right? Right? I mean, you're going to go home and hear my message, right? And you're going to be like, well, I think that, well, that one part was funny. But otherwise, I don't know if, if Pastor Lance was completely correct on all that. You're allowed to doubt me. Why? I'm a human being. I have distortion in me. You're not hearing the pure word of God, right? I'm messing it up. But that's what a mediator does. It's better than nothing, but it's not awesome. So God works through this distorted speaker system. What's intriguing to me is it didn't stop there. Phase C, get them back to Eden. All of a sudden, God takes on human form in the person of Jesus Christ, and we're back to Eden. Why? Because now you have humanity walking right alongside God in human form. That is a trip. Right now, there's still sin, right? So Jesus can only get so close, and that you know he didn't get to be with everybody. He kind of got to be with like twelve, and then some crowds and stuff like that. But now we're back to Eden. God walking right alongside. Now all of a sudden we have a Bible with red letters, sweet, where He's talking to us direct, right? And we're like, I didn't have to go through a mediator. Now I have a direct voice from God. Jesus Christ is now telling us what we need to know. This is awesome. But God's not content with it. Because when he redeems, he makes it better than it was before. We're not interested in simply Eden. So how does Jesus' era stop? You guys remember that? How does it cap off? At the cross and resurrection. Why is that important? Because when Jesus Christ died, he died for the sins of the world, yes? And what did it cause? Well, he gave you a visual representation. There was a temple, and in that temple, there was a room that was his presence. And then there was everybody else, and it was separated by a curtain. When Jesus died, that curtain was ripped apart from the top to the bottom, and they couldn't reach the top. So who ripped the curtain? God. God ripped the curtain and said, I'm tired of something between you and me, so I'm now coming out, and I'm going to be right with you in your presence at all times. All of a sudden, we see the launch of Pentecost, where the new church launches, the new era begins, the new covenant kicks off. Why? God goes right inside people, and he starts speaking from the inside out. Tell you what, Eden never had God inside. It's better than it was at the beginning. God always gets closer. We're the ones creating the distance. Hmm. <coughs> Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ through the cross. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Now he speaks from the inside out. Hmm. You guys, in our time together, in our groups, 
we're going to talk about just this whole concept of how does God communicate to us? How does it work with you? How does it work with me? We're going to start telling some personal stories. Because sometimes I think he's talking to us and we're just not tracking on it, right? Please don't ever believe that God is silent. I think it is a mistake to believe that God can only speak through his word. Because here's how it would basically be. Hey, Lance, I had an awesome story for you. And so anyway, I was just trying to tell you that you should. And so I would, right? You think you got that kind of power? God just shuts down because you shut the book? No, you see, God's been communicating you constantly. One of the things that our church needs to learn is how to track on the voice of God. It's one of the biggest questions I get all the time. I can't hear God. I can't figure out God. I'm going to tell you, you've been hearing God a ton. You just don't recognize it as such. You just think you're awesome. (laughs) You see, we need to learn how to discern, is it my voice? Is it God's voice? Is it Satan's voice? Because, man, they all sound really similar, right? Why do you think that is? I think it's because we think we're God and and Satan tries to pretend to be God. But at some point, you get used to the difference. You start tracking on the difference in content. And you start sifting and sorting very quickly. And you begin to track. That thought was from the Lord. That thought has nothing to do with me. Oh, that was me. Oh, that was the enemy. And the faster you can sift and sort that, you begin to track and have a personal walk with Jesus Christ, him and his Holy Spirit communicating to you all the time. Y'all, let me just say this. This whole idea of having a personal relationship with God, you can't just take it or leave it. It is the thing. You can't just say, well, that's not really how I am designed. No, it is how you're designed. As a matter of fact, the concept of being saved, the concept of becoming a Christian, the Bible refers to as knowing Christ and him knowing you. But it doesn't mean in Greek knowing about, it means knowing by experience. So do you have an experience with Jesus Christ? Do you have a walking, breathing, living experience with Jesus Christ? You don't get to just say, well, that's not my style. It is the style of the saved. So we got to grow up in that area, amen? Amen. Can I have the prayer team come on up here? You see, Paul finishes this out by saying this. He said, man, he did all this to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now, that to me is called a confusing sentence. I don't even know what he was talking about. So I had to dig through it. I paraphrased it. So here you go. Here's my paraphrase. God did all this so that all of creation watching would be stunned at the power and sweetness of how kind and loving God is and the way that he lavishes love on us through what Jesus Christ did. That's it. God is personal. We're the ones that create the distance. But God is not content with the distance that you're content with. Some of us are okay standing far away from the mountain because we're afraid of what would happen if we got any closer. God's not content with that. And so he's going to keep gently peppering you with dreams of more. You're going to have agitations in your spirit where you're going to say, man, Christianity feels a little dry, feels a little boring, feels a little detached. That's God's whispers into your spirit and going, it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be this way. He is going to love you gently into closer connection with him every day. Why? Because he's not content with what we're content with. So we're going to close out, and I want to just share this. If there are any of you I can hear my voice that have yet to begin a relationship with Jesus. And you're going, man, all that stuff sounds awesome. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. If that is you and you've never had that time to be able to say, Jesus, I'm done with me. I need you. If you're willing to say, I'm not cutting it, I need you. If you're willing to say, you're the only one that can bring me alive. If you are at that place in your life, our prayer team is ready to talk with you. They know how to begin that journey. Now, they're not going to know everything. You're allowed to walk up and go, I don't even know why I'm here. But they know how to answer questions. 
They know that it begins with a journey, and you're going to go, man, it feels like it's going to be awkward. It is. Why? All new relationships are awkward, but then they become super normal. Are you ready to begin that journey today? If you are, man, this prayer team is ready to go. They are not just prayer warriors. They're evangelists. So I'm going to close this out by just praying that all of us would have a renewed hope and excitement and encouragement to reconnect with our God personally, just as his child, uniquely. We ready to do that? Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are good and glorious and wonderful. God, you have pursued us all throughout history, both collectively and individually. And Lord, right now, we're quite aware of your love. You just reminded us in your word that you want absolute connection, that you want to come inside where there's no walls anymore, that you want to dwell in our hearts so that everywhere we go, we are a walking temple and your presence dwells within us. Holy Spirit, you want to begin to speak from the inside out, beginning to permeate our thought life, beginning to share with us impressions and ideas about your leading. May we be more sensitive to that. May we know how to discern our voices, your voice, the voice of the enemy, so that, Lord, we would not be led astray. God, we are so thankful for your personal love for us. Would you save us all? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next time.